Hello everyone. Today we're going to do a full review of AP Statistics. Unit 1, one variable data. This unit will just focus on, as pretty explanatory, one variable data. Not two variable, just one. So generally we can categorize variables into two types, categorical, and that means they take on values that have category names or labels, like race or educational degree, or quantitative variables, which take on numerical values, like height or weight. So how do we represent categorical variables, the non-numerical ones? Frequency tables tend to give the exact number of cases in each category, and you can also create relative frequency tables, and that will just show the proportion falling into each category. And since relative frequency is just a proportion, a percent accomplishes the same thing. You can also use by charts and pie charts to show the frequency, the relative frequencies for categorical data, and it might be easier to better visualize it. So here's a relative frequency table. Um, so there's a degree, high school, bachelor's or master's. And then the like the first column is just a degree. The second column is the count, how many people in like some sample had that. And the final uh, column is the relative frequency. And this is one way to represent categorical variables through this frequency table. How do you represent quantitative variables? So there are two types of quantitative variables. First are discrete. Discrete variables take on a countable number of values. Think of one, two, three, and so on. You can have like a fraction of it, for example. But continuous variables, they will take on infinitely many valuables, no matter how small an interval there can be between them. Think of 0 0.001, 0 0.005, 0 0.00001. For continu continuous variables, think of time. There can always be like a more precise time. And for discrete variable, think of how many books you have. You can have 1.1 books. You only have one, two, three, so on for books. A histogram will show the number or the proportion of observations falling within, within an interval. And another way to represent it is through stem and leaf plots. The data is just split into a stem, which is the first digit, and the leaf, which is the last digit. Then you'll just sort of plot it and yeah, you can observe the graph from there. Dot plots are another way too. They will show observations with a dot. So it will be a number line on the horizontal axis and each observation will be a dot and two dots stacked on top of each other means two instances of that position or that, yeah, that instance. So here's an example. The thing on the left is a stem and leaf plot. So the actual data here is 12, 25, 26, 27, 37, 108, and 109. And this is how you represent it using a stem and leaf plot. On the right, we just have, a, I guess, a histogram. And yeah, I, I didn't really label it, but yeah, this is a histogram. On the x-axis, it'll be showing the ranges, ranges of the of the numerical variable, the quantitative variable. And on the y-axis will be the frequency. So how do you describe these distributions for quantitative variables? So we generally focus on the shape, the center, the variability, and the unusual features. Unusual features just refer to outliers, gaps, or clusters. Outliers are just un unusually small or large sample data, and gaps are just areas where there's no data in between. A distribution skewed to the right, positive skew, means that the right tail will be longer than the left tail. And the skewed to the left, a negative, means that the left tail will be longer than the right tail. So one way to find skewness is just find the peak and see if the tail from the peak on the left side is bigger or the right side is bigger. A symmetric distribution means the left side will be approximately mirroring the right half. And that's pretty easy to see on a graph. Furthermore, you can um, classify it based on unimodal, bimodal, or uniform. Unimodal means just one peak. Bimodal means approximately two equal peaks. And a uniform distribution means all of the values are relatively similar. So there's no distinct 
or unique peak. Okay, now I'm gonna summarize the statistics for a quantitative variable. The mean is just the sum of all the values divided by the number of values. The median is the middle value. The first quartile is the first 25% of values. So essentially it's just the median from zero to the actual median. The third quartile is the final 25% of data. So that means the median from the overall median to the last value, it's the median of those two. In the IQR, the interquartile range, includes values from quarter one to quarter three. And that's the middle 50% of values in an order set. Range is the difference between the max and minimum values, and it measures variability. Another way to measure variability is IQR. So on the exam, you can either, you can use any of these when describing a distribution. The standard deviation also measures variability. And that is just the sum of the differences between each value in the mean squared divided by n minus one, and all of that will be square rooted. So to find the standard deviation, first find the mean. Then for every single value, um, find the mean minus that value squared, sum all of those up, divide that by n minus one, the sample size minus one, and then square root all of that. And yeah. On your graphing calculator, you should be able to do this pretty easily and quickly. Outliers are values greater than 1.5 times the interquartile range plus the third quarter value, or they will be less than quarter one minus 1.5 times the interquartile range. So any values outside of those boundaries are considered outliers. The mean standard deviation and range are always non-resistant. Uh, yeah, and they are, um, sorry, the mean standard deviation and range will be, yeah, non-resistant because they're influenced by out outliers. But the median and the IQR, they are resistant. Because the outliers will not affect them greatly. Think of it, if you have one extra outlier, the median is not going to be changed completely. But the mean could be. And so here is sort of a box plot. I've, you label the median, the quarter one, quarter three, and then you also label the minimum and maximum values out that are the outlier ranges. And then any values outside of those ranges will be marked as outliers. Also note that if a graph is skewed to the right, the mean will be to the right of the median. If it's skewed to the left, the mean will be to the left of the median. And if it's uh, not skewed at all, then the mean will be approximately close to the median. The normal distribution. The normal distribution has a bell shape and is symmetric. The empirical rule of the normal distribution states that 68% of the alterations will be one standard deviation from the mean, 95% of the alterations will be two standard deviations from the mean, and 99.7 alterations will be three standard deviations of the mean. Also, you can use the standardized z-score, which is just the value minus the mean over the standard deviation to find percentiles. And this z-score, it just measures how many standard deviations above or below a certain data value lies. And yeah, you use the z-score and the z-table or the graphing calculator to find how common or uncommon a trade is, how, what percentile it'll be in. So that's why it's really useful. Unit two, two variable data. So how you represent two categorical variables? A two-way contingency table will summarize two categorical variables. And the joint relative frequency is just the cell frequency divided by the total for that table. So here is an example. So um, from the columns, I, have, I didn't really label anything. I just labeled one, two. And on the rows, I labeled three and four. And then I also have a total one, the total for the top, and the total two, the total for the bottom. And yeah, this is just a frequency table. So the um, one and three is five, two and three is five, one and four is three, and two and four is 11. And then all the totals are there too. So the joint relative frequency will just be the cell frequency of a cell of like one and three, for example, and that'll be divided by the total of that table. 
The marginal relative frequency will be the row and column totals in a two-way table divided by the total. So if we go back here, the marginal relative frequency will be like the total of um, read, which is 10 divided by 24. The conditional relative frequency will just be the self frequency in a row divided by the total in that row. So that would be like, um, let's say two and three is five divided by the total in that row, 10, or two and three is five divided by the total in that column, 16. And yeah, scatter plots. So bivariate quantitative data will always consist of observations from two different quantitative variables from individuals. The scatter plot will show the two numerical values plotted against each other. So one will be on the x-axis and one will be on the y-axis. Explanatory variable will usually be plotted on the x-axis and they're used to explain or predict the response variable. And from the scatter plot, you can, you can identify the direction, approximate direction, if it's positive, so positive slope or negative slope. You can identify the form, which is like linear, nonlinear, or or um, a different like squared, quadratic, so on. And you can also identify the strength. So how closely the individuals will follow the pattern. So it can strongly follow it, it can moderately follow it, or weakly follow it. The correlation, R, just gives this direction and the strength of a linear association. And you can calculate it by using technology or by just doing this equation, which is um, one over n minus one, times by the sum, the sum of all the xi minus x mean over the standard deviation of x, times by yi minus y mean divided by the standard deviation of y. And it'll be that for all the xi and all the xy. The correlation will be unit free value, and it's always gonna be between minus one and one. So a value of r closer to zero means no linear association, but closer to one or minus one means an almost perfect linear association. And also always note that correlation never implies causation. To, impl to determine causation, you need, you need to create a well-defined experiment, which we'll go over in the next unit. A linear regression model just uses an equation and it fits the X variable to predict the Y variable. For example, Y hat is equal to A plus BX. A is the y-intercept and B is the slope. This is just point slope form. Um, I think most people learned it in algebra one. Extrapolation is using the equation to predict a value of x, which is not included in the interval. Since that value of x is not included in the interval, that means less reliable estimates. The residual is the difference between the actual and the predicted value. So y minus y hat, the actual value minus the predicted value, and residual plots just show the residual versus the explanatory variable values or predicted response values. And we can use these residual plots to show, to determine how well a variable is fitted to the equation. Note that randomness from a residual plot, that just means a linear model is appropriate to describe the variable. But if there's some pattern like a U, then um, the linear model will not be appropriate to describe the variables. Least square regression generally minimizes the sum of the squares of the residuals and will always contain the point, the mean of X and the mean of Y. The slope B of the regression line is R, the correlation coefficient, times by the standard deviation of Y or the standard deviation of X. And R squared is just the square of the correlation and it's called the coefficient of determination. This is, um, to interpret this in context, is the proportion of variation in the response variable that, that we can explain by the model. Outliers will not follow the general trend and will have a large residual. High leverage points will have a substantially larger or smaller X value. And an influential point, if removed, it can change the relationship majorly. Also note that a point can be identified as uh, more than one of the above. So be sure to know what they mean. Finally, you can linearize data by transforming through squaring or doing the log or other factors too of one of the variables. And this can create a more linear relationship. Unit three, collecting data. So this unit is more about observations and experiments. So how do you plan a study? First, let's go over some vocabulary. First of all, a population 
just consists of all the items or subjects of interest. A sample is a subset of the population and treatments, um, treatments will be imposed in experiments, but not in observational studies. In observational studies, it can be retrospective. That just means examining current data for individuals or prospective, which is examining future data to investigate a topic of interest. In experiments, different treatments are assigned to experimental units. And we can use that to find results. Randomly selected samples or representative samples can be used to make generalizations for the population. It's really important that the, um, the samples are selected randomly and are representative. Generally, experiments, a well-defined experiment can cause can result in a causal relationship. But in observational studies, we cannot assume that. The random sampling just refers to sampling without replacement. So that just means an item can only be selected once. Otherwise, it will be called sampling with replacement. A simple random sampling, SRS, are samples where every group of a certain size have an equal chance of being chosen. One example of this, pretty basic, just number every individual and use a random number generator to select which ones are included in the sample. However, sampling can become more complex. Stratified random samples involve dividing a population into separate groups called strata based on shared characteristics. Then people from each stratum will be chosen using a SRS and the selected units will form the sample. Clustering is dividing a population into smaller clusters where each cluster is similar to one another and the whole population. So you'll divide it into clusters and each population, I mean, each cluster has to be representative of the population and has to be similar to each other. So then you just randomly choose this cluster. Systematic random sampling is choosing members from a population according to a random starting value in a fixed interval. For example, and let's say everyone did a line, I'll always choose the fifth person. So fifth, 10, 15, so on. Finally, a census selects all the items in the population. These are some terms you should know for sampling. However, sampling in certain ways can cause problems. First problem is bias. Bias is when responses are systematically favored over others. So certain ones will be favored over others. And this is obviously bad as it can skew the data. Voluntary response bias refers to when a sample is chosen of people and all of them want to participate. Think of it, if people want to participate in your sample, they obviously have a point of view, right? So yeah, that's an issue. Next is under coverage bias. This is when part of a population has a reduced chance of being included in the sample. So the sample might not be representative of the population. This is obviously a problem because you want it to be representative. Non-response bias is when people refuse to give their data, leading to bias. So people are chosen, but they don't want to give you the data. And furthermore, confusing, misleading, or poor question wording can all lead to bias. Self-reported responses also lead to bias. Non-random random sampling methods like convenience sampling introduce bias as a random chance and is not used to select individuals. So we should not use um, non-random sampling, like convenience sampling. Convenience sampling just refers to like, I'm a physics teacher, but I want um, I want a, pop a sample of the whole school, but I'm just gonna choose people in my physics class because they're my students. You know, that'll obviously lead to issues. Experimental design. Experimental units are the individuals assigned treatments. The people, participating in the experiment. They can be referred to as subjects too. Explanatory variables are the variables that are manipulated. And they're also referred to as treatments. And the goal is to find, find something from the response variable by manipulating the experimental variable. The confounding variables tend to influence re response variable and create a false dissociation. So that's why we should try to eliminate or reduce confounding variables as much as possible. For example, I'm doing a study on, let's say I'm doing a study on coffee drinkers. 
I want to find out the relationship between coffee drinkers and if they get heart disease. But on average, coffee drinkers are more likely to smoke. So the smoking could be confounding the relationship between coffee and heart disease. A well-designed experiment will include a comparison of two treatment groups. One can be a control group or a random assignment. Sorry, one can be a control group or you can just be comparing two different groups. Furthermore, it should also have random assignment. And you should also replicate more than one unit in each group as just having one unit could be like an anomaly. And finally, you should try to control the confounding variables. Continuing on experimental design, in completely randomized designs, treatments are randomly assigned to experimental units, and this can balance the effect of confounding variables. So think of um, completely randomized design as just a simple random sample, but for experiments. A random number generator, the one way to do this is using a random number, number generator, the drawing chips for, or drawing chips without replacement. A single blind experiment means that the subjects do not know which treatment they're receiving, but the research team members do. Or the research team members do not know which treatments they're giving, but the subjects do. That's why it's single blind. Double blind means that neither the subject nor the researcher know which treatment the subject is receiving. Double blind experiments are often best because then no one will intentionally screw up or like try to bias the results. And control groups are generally not given a treatment, but they're given a placebo. For example, let's say I'm doing a study on if coffee helps students study. I'll give one group actual coffee and another group a drink. They won't be able to tell if it's coffee or not. So they'll assume they got coffee and no one will know. So like, think of it this way, right? If I give, if I tell people that I'm not giving them coffee and I'm going to see how well they perform, they might perform worse on purpose or psychologically perform worse. That's why we give them a placebo. Randomized block designs are when patients are separated into different blocks. This is similar to a stratified random sample, but this is for experiments. Patients in each block should be similar to each other. And then you'll choose a representative proportion by choosing patients from each block. Matched pair designs are when subjects are arranged into pairs based on relevant factors. So both pairs will receive one treatment. So People are assigned it to pairs, and then you'll compare how both the pairs do, and they should be relatively similar, the pair. Also note that statistically significant results, they cannot be achieved by chance alone. That's why if an experiment results in statistically significant results, we can, we can conclude something. Unit four, probability. Introduction to probability. So a random process generates results which are based on chance. A simulation can model random events such that they match real world outcomes. That's why it's pretty useful simulations as modeling random events will reduce computational expensiveness. Relative frequency can be used to estimate the probability of an event. The law of large numbers states that simulated probabilities will get closer to the actual probability with more trials. This just makes logical sense. Also note that the probability of event A happening is the number of outcomes in event A over the total number of outcomes in the sample space. Also note that probability will always be between zero and one. A complement or the complementary probability is the probability of an event not happening. So the probability of the complement is of a complement A is one minus A, and it's repre represented as AC, complement of A. Probabilities can be used to approximate the frequency of how often an event will occur in the long run. Conditional events are um are events that depend on a condition of the other one occurring. The two events will be mutually ex exclusive or disjoint, and they cannot occur at the same time. 
And the probability of two events happening is called the joint probability. Therefore, if two events are mutually exclusive, the joint probability will be zero. The multiplication rule states that the probability that both events A and B will occur is the probability of A times the probability of B given that A occurs. And that's how you represent B given A occurs, use the um, slash sign, that straight slash sign. So if A and B are independent, then the probability just probability of A times the probability of B. And the probability of A given B is the probability of A and B, the intersection, over the probability of B. Events A and B can be independent if knowing whether one event occurred does not change the probability of the other one occurring. That's how you define if two events are independent. The probability of both A and B occurring, if they are independent, are the probabilities of both of them just multiplied. And the probability that events A and B will occur is the sum of both minus the probability of both occurring. So the sum of the probability of A by itself plus the probability of B minus the probability of both A and B. That's the probability that both will occur. Probability distribution. Cumulative probability distribution can be represented as a table or a graph, and they show the probability of being less than or equal to a certain value. Interpretations of a probability distribution provide information on the shape, center, and spread. And we can interpret probability distributions the same way. The mean or expected value of a random variable the sum of all xi times the probability of xi. For example, um, let's say the probability of rolling a 3 is 0 0.1, probability of rolling a 4 is 0 0.3, and the probability of rolling a 5 is 0 0.6. The expected value is um, 3 times by 0 0.1 plus 4 times by 0 0.3 plus 5 times by 0 0.6. The standard deviation of a random variable is the square root of the sum of all xi minus x mean, the mean squared, times by the probability of xi. So for all xi, you will find xi minus x mean squared, multiply that by the probability of xi occurring, you'll sum all of that up for every xi, and then you'll square root all of that. That's the standard deviation. For random variables x and y and real numbers a and b, the mean of ax plus by this equals the, the a times the mean of x plus b times the mean of y. The variance of ax plus by equals a squared times the standard deviation of x squared plus b squared times the standard deviation of y squared. The standard deviation is just the square root of variance. And yeah, that's how you find the standard deviation from that variance equation. A binomial distribution refers to a certain type of distribution where all the conditions are met. So it must count the number of successes or failures. So it has to be a binary outcome. There has to be a set number of trials. The trials all have to be independent of each other. And there has to be a constant value, a probability of success or failure. So the probability cannot change within each new trial. For example, think of the the chance of a shooter making 10 shots out of 20, assuming that his shooting probability is constant. So if you've identified a distribution as binomial, the probability for x successes in n trials is just n choose x multiplied by p to the power of x times by 1 minus p to the power of n minus x. So n choose x is the how many ways to get x successes. p to the power of x is probability of getting those successes. And 1 minus p to the power of n minus x is the probability of getting the rest of them as failures. The mean or expected value of a binomial distribution is just n times by p. And the standard deviation is the square root of np times by 1 minus p. Geometric random variables give the number of trials until the first success. So think of it this way. It'll be fail, 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 and then the first success, and that's where it ends. That's how you, that's a geometric random variable and a geometric distribution. 
the probability for the first success on the x trial is 1 minus p to the power of x minus 1. And the mean of a geometric distribution will be 1 over p. The standard deviation will be the square root of 1 minus p over p. And the square root just refers to the thing on top, not the bottom. Unit 5, sampling distributions. A point estimate is a single best estimate for a parameter of a population. Unbiased estimates will equal the value of the population parameter, but biased estimates will not. Generally, if you random sample, the it will generally be an unbiased estimate. A sample statistic is a point estimator of the population parameter. Sampling distributions for sample proportions. For independent samples of a categorical variable with population proportion P, this is how you find the uh, standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Square root of P times by one minus P over N. So for the standard deviation to be equal to that, we need the 10% rule to be true. The sample size has to be less than 10% of the population. The large counts rule states that a sampling distribution will be about normal when n times by p is less than greater than or equal to 10, or n times by 1 minus p is greater than or equal to 10. And both of them, both of them have to be true for a sample proportion um, to be approximately normal. So think of it this way. We have a huge population. We don't want to find every single sample, right? That's going to take so long, finding every single sample of a certain size n. <laughs> Instead, we just model the sampling distribution from the normal distribution. And for that to be true, we need um, n times the proportion. Let's say the proportion is 0 0.3. That has to be bigger than 10. And n times by 1 minus p, that also has to be bigger than 10. And generally, a random least sample sampling distribution will have its mean, the center, be equal to the true population proportion. So we can model a sampling distribution this way. And since you can model a sampling distribution, you can also uh, model the different in sample proportions. Random sampling from two independent populations with root proportions of P1 and P2, the mean of the sampling distribution will be P1 minus P2. This just makes sense, right? Assuming an unbiased estimator. The standard deviation will be equal to the square root of P1 times by one minus P1 over N plus P2 times by one minus P2 over N, and all of that will be square rooted. And you still need to make sure the 10% rule and the large count rule still apply for both of them. Now we're gonna move on to um, sampling distributions for mean. The last two slides were on um, sample proportions. A sampling distribution is the distribution for all possible samples of a given size from a population for a statistic. The central limit theorem states that when a sample size is large enough, meaning 30 or more, we assume the sampling distribution of the mean to be normal. And this is for a sampling distribution for mean. The CLT requires that the sample values are all independent of each other. And the sampling distribution can be generated by repeated random sampling, but if the population is huge, this can be costly. This is why we need these inferences to be true then we can model the sampling distribution without all that cost. So for random sampling with replacement from a population, the sampling distribution sample mean will be about equal to the true population mean. And the standard deviation will be equal to the population standard deviation divided by the square root of that. And the 10% rule still applies for us to, uh, to, to have independence or to assume independence in drawing the population in drawing the sampling distribution. And if the population can be modeled with the normal distribution from the central limit theorem, or if the distribution is normal by itself, the sampling distribution of the mean can as well. But if not, the central limit theorem must apply. So basically that just means that a sampling, just um, if the population is a normal distribution, 
we don't need the central limit theorem to apply. But if it's not, then we do to model the actual sampling distribution of the actual population by a normal distribution. And again, we can create a sampling distribution for a difference in sample means. The mean of a difference of a sampling distribution is the mean one minus mean two. Standard deviation is equal to the square root of SD1 squared plus divided by N1 plus SD2 squared divided by N2. And all of that is square rooted. And note that both populations must follow the 10% rule for this to be true. Unit six, inference for proportions. So I'm gonna introduce what confidence intervals are. First, you should know that a one sample Z interval is used to create a confidence interval for one sample proportion for one categorical variable. The data should be randomly collected. The 10% rule must apply and the large counts rule must apply because it's a Z interval, so the normal distribution has to be, we need to assume it's a normal distribution. The standard error of a statistic is the square root of P hat times by one minus P hat over N, where P hat is the sample proportion. And the margin of error is Z star times by the standard error. Z star is the critical value. It provides the region of rejection. And to find the critical value, we look up the significance level divided by one or two on the Z table. So the significance level will be divided by one if it's um, if it's one-sided, I believe, or if it's two-sided, I think it will be divided by one. Or yeah, I'm not, I'm not too sure, but like you should um, look at the significance level on the Z, Z table or on your calculator. And the margin of error gives how much a value is likely to vary from the population parameter. A confidence interval will either contain the proportion or will not. So how to interpret it is we are C% percent confident that the interval captures the true proportion. Or in repeated sampling of the same size, around C% percent of confidence intervals will capture the population proportion. The width of a confidence, confidence interval is proportional to one over the square root of n, and the width of the confidence interval increases as the confidence level increases, assuming everything else is the same. Test for population proportions. So generally, there's going to be a null and alternate hypothesis. The null hypothesis is H0 and is assumed to be correct unless evidence says otherwise. And the alternative hypothesis, HA, is what we're trying to prove, or the situation for which evidence is being collected. And the alternative hypothesis can be one-sided or two-sided. A one-sided means that it's just, for example, if the null hypothesis is x is equal to 10, alternate will be x is greater than 10 if it's one-sided. If it's two-sided, it will be x is not equal to 10. And we again make statistical inferences. We check for randomization, we check for the 10% rule, and we check for the large count rule. How do we interpret p-values? So first, the z-test is the sample statistic minus the null value. And the, divided by the standard deviation of the statistic. And the standard deviation equals the square root of p0 times by 1 minus p0 over n. And we use this to find, we use this on a, um, using the z-table or using our calculator and we, and we see it's essentially the chance of a test statistic being as extreme or more extreme than the observed test statistic when the null hypothesis is, is true, it is assumed to be true. And the p-value is computed assuming that the probability model and the null hypothesis is true. So once we get our p-value, essentially um, if the p-value is less than alpha, which is the significance level, we reject the null hypothesis. If p-value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. So the significance level alpha is just the predetermined probability of rejecting the null hypothesis given it is true. 
Rejecting the null hypothesis means that there is convincing statistical evidence to support the alternative. And the lower the p-value, the more evidence for the, for the alternative hypothesis. Because if the p-value is greater than the um, significance level, we keep the null hypothesis. So we fail to reject it. And obviously, there can be some errors when failing or rejecting the null hypothesis. Type 1 error means the null hypothesis is true and is rejected. That's a false positive. A type 2 error is when the null hypothesis is false and is not rejected, which is a false negative. Significance level alpha is the probability of making a type 1 error if the null hypothesis is true. And the probability of a type 2 error is 1 minus the power of a test. The power of the test is the probability a test correctly rejects a false null hypothesis. The probability of a type 2 error decreases when the sample size increases, the significance level increases, or when the standard error decreases. Also, when the true parameter is farther from the null value. We can also use confidence intervals for a difference of two proportions. For this, we use the two sample Z interval for a difference between population proportions. All conditions for both population samples must be satisfied. Similar equation as before, we just use the two sample standard deviation equation with the same critical value C star. And the null and alternate hypothesis are the same. But for a two sample proportion for a confidence interval, we use a new normality check. We essentially find the combined p hat, combined proportion. And we do that by n1 times by p hat 1 plus n2 times by p hat 2 over n1 plus n2. We check if n1 and 2 times by p hat c and n1 and n2 times by 1 minus p hat c all of those have to be greater than or equal to 10 individually. And only then we can do this confidence interval for a difference of two proportions. So how do we carry out a test for a difference of two population proportions? So we again use the z-test to find the p-value and we still use the same rules for rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis. And here I just include an image. I essentially just wrote the equation so it's easier to see. Um, PC, P hat C, is N1 times by P hat 1 plus N2 times by P hat 2 over N1 plus N2. The Z score is P hat 1 minus P hat 2 minus 0 um, divided by the square root of P hat C times by 1 minus P hat C multiplied by the square root of 1 over N1 plus 1 over N2. Yeah. Unit seven, inference for means. So we can also use confidence intervals for a population mean. If we use the standard deviation from a sample, rather than using the standard deviation of a whole population, we use the t-distribution of the normal distribution, rather than the normal distribution. Sometimes we don't know the standard deviation of a whole population. So we just use the standard deviation of a sample. So this is why we use a new distribution called the t-distribution. So in a t-distribution, most of the area will be allocated to the tails of the density curve rather than in normal distribution. Also, we use degree of freedom in t-distributions. The degree of freedom is just n minus one. And as it increases, the area in the tails of a t-distribution decreases. So here's just um, the standardized t-score. Um, the mean of the sampling distribution minus the overall population mean divided by the standard deviation of that um, sampling mean of the sampling distribution, or I mean, sorry, that one sample divided by the square root of n, n in the sample. So again, we check for independence. We do this by checking for random sampling and the 10% rule. We also check for normality. If the distribution is skewed, so that means n is greater than or equal to 30. Um, we, we, yeah, so if the distribution is skewed, n has to be greater than or equal to 30 by the central limit theorem. 
but if n is less than 30, the distribution should have no strong skewness or outliers. Also, we use a table or the calculator to find the T star value. Standard error is just S over the square root of n. And the margin of error is equal to T star times by S over the square root of n. Same as before, instead of using Z star, we use T star. A point estimate for a population mean is a sample mean. Therefore, the confidence interval will just be the, the mean of the uh, sample, x bar, plus or minus t star multiplied by the um, s over the square root of n, the standard error. So a confidence interval for a population mean will either contain the mean or not. So we interpret it pretty similarly. We are C percent confident that the confidence interval for a population mean captures the true population mean. The width of a confidence interval decreases as sample size increases, and it increases as confidence level increases. We use a one sample t-test for a population mean. And even if we use a match pairs design, it's still one sample, because think of it as one sample of pairs instead of two different samples. The p-value, again, just assumes the null hypothesis is true. And if we use a formal decision, we compare the p-value to the significance level. p-value greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. p-value less than or equal to alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. Pretty similar to before. Again, we can also use confidence intervals to model the difference of two means. Distributions of populations one and two will be normal if n1 and n2 are both greater than 30. The n1 and n2 both have to be bigger than 30. The sampling distribution of difference will be normal. The two sample t interval for a difference in population means is what we use. And the margin of error is t star times by the standard deviation once again, but there's a new standard deviation. The point estimate equals the difference in the two sample means. The point estimate here is x1 bar minus x2 bar. And for the constant interval, we do plus or minus t star times by the standard deviation, which is the square root of x1 squared divided by n1 plus x2 squared divided by n2. <laughs> So how do we interpret the confidence interval? Again, it's just in repeated random sampling with the same sample size, C percent of confidence interval will capture the difference of population means. The null hypothesis assumes both populations have the same mean. Alternative will assume um, one means greater than the other or just different. And again, we just use the same rules. Random sampling, 10% rule, greater than 30 is skewed, or it can be less than 30 if there is no strong skewness or outliers. And we can find the degrees of freedom using a graphing calculator. Just plug in all the data and it'll do everything for you. And we interpret the p-value in the same way. Yeah, here's just how to find the how to find the t the standardized t score. And then we look at the table to find the p-value. Unit A, chi-score tests. So chi-score tests are used for categorical variables. Like the last, like what, three units? I think five, six, seven. We did it for proportions and means. Now this is gonna be um, more checking categorical data if they follow a pattern or if they're, um, or if they're similar to each other. So expected counts of categorical data will be consistent with the null hypothesis. The chi-score statistic measures the distance between observed and expected counts relative to expected counts. And note that chi-score distributions are always positive and will always be skewed to the right. But the skew becomes less pronounced with increasing degrees of freedom. The null hypothesis specifies the null proportions for each category. And the alternative hypothesis is just that one of these proportions is not as predicted. 
we use the goodness of fit test for one categorical variable. So again, random sample, 10% rule, and large count. But in large counts, for a chi-square goodness of fit test, all the expected counts just have to be greater than or equal to five. So the chi-square value, x squared, is the observed count minus the expected count squared divided by the expected count. We essentially um, find the sum of all of these for every single value. And yes, yeah, so we have to find the expected count. So how expected each instance will, what's the expected value of each instance occurring? And the degrees of freedom is the number of categories minus one as usual. Again, we find the p-value and we interpret the p-value the same way as before. Reject or accept, reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we can also use the chi-square test for homogeneity or independence. So the, for these two chi-square tests, it will be a two-way table, so more two categorical variables. And to find the expected count, it's just the row table times the column table over the table total. So the total, so the row, the total in the row times the total in the column divided by the total in the table. Homogeneity, this just refers to H0, meaning no difference in the distributions of a categorical variable. And the alternate meaning there is a difference in the distributions of a categorical variable. Independence means H0 means no association in distributions of two categorical variables. HA means that there is an association in distribution of two categorical variables. And again, we use the same checks, random sampling, 10% rule, and large counts. So again, we find the expected counts for each value in the table. And let's go back to the last slide. The expected count is the row table times by the column table divided by the table total. And yeah, it's just expected count minus observed count squared over expected count, the sum of all of those. The degree of freedom is the number of rows minus one times the number of columns minus one. And we can use technology to find the p-value. The p-value again is the proportion of values in a chi-square distribution with the right degree of freedom that are equal to or larger than the test statistic. And again, we interpret the p-value the same way. If given the null hypothesis is true, there will be a value more extreme. And we use the p-value compared to the significance level to reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, last unit, inference for slopes. So now we're going to go over confidence intervals for the slope of a regression model. First, know that variation in a point's position relative to a line can be random or may not be random. So for a sampling distribution of slopes, the center will be the mean of all the slopes. And the standard error of the slope will be S divided by the um, Sx times by the square root of n minus 1. S is the standard deviation of sample residuals. Sx is the standard deviation of the sample of x values. The shape of a sampling distribution for a sample slope will be normal. And when using the standard error of slope, we use the T model with degrees of freedom n minus 2. The relationship between x and my, y must be linear for us for all this to occur. And also note the standard deviation must not vary with x. The standard devi deviation of y must not vary with x. Again, random sampling plus the 10% rule must be true. And if all of these are true, then the interval estimate is b plus or minus um, t star times by the standard error of b. So again, in, um, this is how we interpret the confidence interval. In repeated random sampling, around C percent of confidence intervals created will capture the true slope of the regression model. The width of the confidence interval, again, will decrease with sample size increases. So the t-test for a slope is used for a regression model. 
the null hypothesis is B is equal to B0. The slope, the, act, the sampling distribution slope is equal to the actual true slope. Alternative hypothesis can be not equal to, greater than, or less than the B0. So here are some conditions. It's pretty similar, but there are a few more. Relationship between X and Y is linear. I mean, I guess I mentioned these before, but yeah, relationship between X and Y is linear. Standard deviation of Y will not vary with X. Random sample, 10% rule, and large counts. If the distribution is, is skewed and has to be greater than the, or equal to 30, if not, then it can be less than or equal to 30. The T statistic is just B minus B divided by the standard error of B. And yeah, so again, we find the p-value and interpret it the same way as before. Thank you all for listening. If you found this video helpful at all in any way, we greatly appreciate a subscribe as this video took a long time to take. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and we'll try to get to them. Thanks for listening.